Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our final lunchtime talk of 2019. Uh, just a quick announcement, and actually I have to do this myself. Um, please silence or turn off your cell phones and electronic devices. Um, we want to take a minute here to thank our sponsors, the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation, as well as Sage Creek Ranch, um, who make all of our lunchtime and after dark presentations possible. We're thrilled to host a growing pool of engaging and dynamic speakers, many of which have carved out livelihoods through work and research here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Our capacity to continue attracting these high quality speakers has only been made possible through the generous support of our sponsors, for which we are increasingly grateful. Um, these lectures are being recorded um, and are uploaded to YouTube, so if you've missed any of our previous lectures for this year um, or for last year, you can go to youtube.com, search Draper Natural History Museum, and you'll find those presentations there. Um, if you'd like to be added to our listserv, please flag me down um, either before talk or any time after talk. Also, if you've previously written your name on a list but you have not received emails, it's probably because I couldn't read your handwriting. So flag me down again. Let's get that email down here, and you will receive those notifications. Um, we've also started including links to previous talks in our emails, so another reason to sign up is if you've missed a previous talk and we send you an announcement for an upcoming talk, you'll see links to those earlier ones on that email. We're going to break from the holidays, um, resume our 2020 lecture series in February, February 6th, um, where we'll hear, uh, sorry, with presentations and announcements um, from Draper Natural History Museum curator Nathan Dora. So today, we're going to hear from Mr. Tony Mong. Tony is a wildlife, career wildlife biologist with the Cody District of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Fisheries and Wildlife Science in 2001 from the University of Missouri and a Master's of Science in Wildlife Ecology from Kansas State University in 2005, where he studied resource selection and response of upland sandpipers to fire management activities in prairie ecosystems. And if you guys have never heard the call of an upland sandpiper, it is super cool. So definitely go and Google this afterwards. Monks also spent five years as a research and project manager overseeing all activities associated with demographic, survival, and harvest rates of mourning doves. Mong has since worked with a variety of species and landscapes. In 2010, Mong began his career with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department working as a senior wildlife biologist in bags, where he acquired extensive experience and expertise working with some of Wyoming's most iconic migratory species. His research, which he has funded through successful grant proposals, includes monitoring the response of elk to beetle kill, analyzing pronghorn movement and survival in relation to human occupancy on and use of the landscape, and sex-based differences in mule deer migration. Mong also uses remote operated cameras to assess body conditions of mule deer and leverages a wide variety of tools to ask and answer questions necessary for managing Wyoming's wildlife. I first met Tony in 2017, where we co-taught a migration course with Science Kids Cody here inside the Draper Natural History Museum. Today, I'm honored to host Tony as our final lunchtime expedition speaker of 2019. Please give Tony a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much. I love coming to a talk where they clap first. Uh, because that means that I don't need to do anything else. I've done my job, you've clapped once, so that's great. Um, thank you, Corey, and a, a big thank to, thanks to the uh, Draper Museum for inviting me here. Um, first, I, I've, I've got to start just by, by saying that, you know, I am a biologist. I don't think outside of the biologist realm, so when I was asked to give this talk, um, I was kind of thinking along the lines of uh, a, a talk entitled Lines on the Paper. Um, but I, after, you know, talking with folks that are smarter than me and our uh, Tara and our information education, she's like, yeah, I don't know if that's going to that's gonna cut it. So we came up with something a little bit different. We're going to be talking today a, a, a lot about these four species here, um, bighorn sheep, mountain goats, mule deer, and elk, and how they're using the landscape. But before I even do that, I've got to stop and thank a lot of people because I've only been in Cody for about three years now. And so a lot of the data that I'm going to uh, be showing with you and sharing with you comes from other people. My predecessor, Doug uh, McWhorter, uh, who was here for a long time, uh, put a lot of this information together. Uh, folks out of the University of Montana, Yellowstone National Park, 
um, University of, of Wyoming, the list goes on. So I'm standing on the backs of giants presenting their data. Um, so I want to uh, definitely acknowledge them uh, before we get much, uh, much farther along. So when I was first asked about uh, bringing a presentation, uh, my thought uh, immediately, I, I, and it was last uh, December, I believe, that I was asked to, to give this talk, I started thinking about what is unique about Cody and Cody Wildlife. And one of the most unique things that I've found here is that wildlife are very abundant and very easily seen during the winter, right? We have lots of, of animals in the fields. We have lots of animals on the roads, uh, sometimes to their detriment um, and to our car's detriment. Um, but what's unique is that they come here and then they leave. And a lot of times we have no idea where they're going, um, uh, what they do when, when they're gone. And so that, that was kind of the premise is that, that we really have um, this unique situation where we've got wildlife living in our uh, backyards for a small portion of the year. Now this is great and it, it makes us feel good, but what it can do is, is kind of give, desensitize us to the importance and the uh, amazing effort that these animals make uh, every year to come and live in your backyards. And so what I wanted to do today was just give you kind of a 100,000-foot uh, overview of what uh, it looks like once they leave here and start to talk a little bit about uh, making sure that we give these wildlife the respect that they deserve uh, because of what uh, they go through. I've started to make the, the case that um, Cody wildlife is some of the toughest wildlife, I believe, uh, in the West for the conditions, uh, the challenges that they face um, year to year. So that's what we're going to be kind of, of looking at today. Now, as a biologist, data really drives everything that we do. I get a lot of questions about, well, aren't you just a game warden? And I, I try to explain this to, to people is that, well, game wardens write you tickets and I write reports. And so when you're writing a report, you need lots of data. Uh, you need things to back up what you're going to be saying. And so as a biologist for Game and Fish and other biologists uh, and other agencies, we're constantly collecting data, uh, whether it's uh, swabbing for diseases, uh, checking uh, animals in uh, for harvest, looking at different sizes of animals, uh, doing radio telemetry type uh, research, um, looking at weights of, of fawns, you name it, flying in helicopters, uh, counting uh, elk. We collect all kinds of, of information and data. And that's the good part, right? We collect the data. But once you collect data, you've got to do something with it. And so that's where our computers come in. Um, this, this would be a representation of me sitting down to start to analyze data. And then this is kind of me at about midway to the end of uh, analyzing data. And so uh, it's a, it's a double-edged sword when you collect information. You've got to do something with it. One of the probably the coolest pieces of information that, that or pieces of data that we get to collect involves capturing animals. And uh, that is uh, putting collars on animals and getting animals in, in hand. And uh, that's where you get these pretty pictures. Um, and that's where you get uh, to, to actually interact in a personal way with, uh, with the animals that you're, you're researching. I will have to say, I don't know if you've seen the picture that, that we put out uh, for advertisement. I was kind of taken aback yesterday when somebody came up to me and they said, man, I saw that picture. I thought you were shooting it with a with a pistol. <laughs> I was like, why would, why would we be shooting elk with a pistol? Um, she didn't have a, a, a reply to that, but I was a little taken aback. So if you saw that picture, I'm not shooting the elk with a pistol, if you thought so. We were releasing the elk uh, in that actual picture. Um, so this allows us to get close to the animals. And a lot of times we, we just think about the kind of the, the end result, which is um, putting these collars on and getting that information. But when we have animals in hand, there's a lot of uh, other information that we're taking. Um, and, you know, the biggest thing uh, that we see nowadays is, is the movement information uh, that's out there. But in addition to that, we also get an opportunity to look at pregnancy rates, 
we also get to look at body fat, uh, body condition in a very uh, uh, real way with um, uh, using ultrasounds. And so once we have the animals in hand, uh, we can collect a lot of great information. And um, in addition to that, uh, the, the movement information that we're collecting, once we put collars on animals, we can start to understand not only how they're using the landscape, but how they're surviving out uh, in the wild. And uh, with that information, then we can start to build a better picture of the, the uh, populations that we're managing. And that's really what it comes down to. As a biologist, as a manager, I want the best information possible to be able to manage these species in a way that allows them to continue on into the future. So that's great. I love these pictures where the animals are already in hand. But in order to get here, we have to actually catch the animals. Uh, and that can get a little difficult. And so over the years, wildlife biologists and, and others have come up with many different methods for catching these animals. Uh, down in bags, I used a lot of uh, drop nets to catch mule deer. Uh, these methods that I'll talk about first are methods where you actually draw the animal into, uh, into an area using some type of bait. And so uh, usually a bait and a net uh, are used. You bring the animals in and uh, capture them that way. Corral tra traps are commonly used for elk. Um, and even with our mountain goat study that, that I'll talk about, uh, there was some use of some traps using uh, salt to try to draw them into these uh, traps where the, um, where the doors actually drop once they go in, and then you're able to, to work the animal up. So that's one method. And another method uh, demonstrated here by um, Doug McWhorter. Um, if you've ever been up the North Fork, these, these uh, bighorn sheep let you get kind of close. And that allows us to dart them uh, right from the truck. So if uh, you see us up there um, working sheep, it's usually after we've darted them. Um, so they're pretty used to that. Um, they're used to vehicles. We can drive up, get close enough, administer a dart that uh, puts the animal to sleep, and then we can work the animal up safely. But I'd say the number one way that we catch animals um, in, in Wyoming is using helicopters. Now... As a guy, as an adventure seeker, as somebody who likes adrenaline, this, this is uh, one of the greatest things that I could ever do, but I don't get to do it <laughs> because it's too dangerous. <laughs> they won't let Game and Fish employees actually uh, do the captures. In most cases, we are actually uh, hiring out uh, companies. Um, one of the companies we use around here, uh, you may have seen this, this blue helicopter around. Uh, is a company out of New Zealand, actually. Uh, they bring a, a crew in, they do some amazing uh, acrobatic flying, uh, throw, put the net uh, over top of an animal, animal gets tangled up, and then they're able to work the animal up. And that's kind of a, a first-hand view that, that I'll probably never get, and that my wife's pretty happy that I don't get to get that uh, view either. Um, I just, I don't know if any of you have been to the captures that, that we've done in the past, but I wanted to give you a little bit of of a sense of what that what that looks like. Now, in some cases, uh, we'll hire the the company. They'll they'll catch the animal, put the collar on, and let them go. Um, but in a lot of cases, they'll bring the animal back, so we can collect that information. We can collect blood. We can look at pregnancy rates. We can look at uh, diseases such as brucellosis, um, and we can we can grab those samples. So that's what you're going to see here. You're going to see uh, this helicopter bringing in an elk. Uh, for a recent elk study that we just started. Well, maybe. So notice the skill of the pilot being able to drop that elk very gently onto the ground. Um, and that allows us to come and start working that animal up in a very safe way. And that's what you see here. Once we have the animal in hand, then we can collect all the information we need to, uh, as well as um, uh, provide uh, and attach the collar and, and allow that animal to, to be released. Now, once we attach a collar, we have this collar on there. And there's, 
uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody understands that where this data comes from. And there's uh, really three components to these radio collars. Now there's an old school collar, uh, which just has a radio transmitter and emits a signal. Uh, back in the day, we had to go out on, on the ground. We had to go and find these animals. Once we found them, we'd take our map out, we'd mark a location, and then we'd go on. Um, and that system involves this collar, which is kind of like a, a radio station. And we have the equipment, the antenna, and the uh, receiver that allows us to pick up that radio station. Each animal has its own individual radio station, so we can keep track of uh, individual animals. Now that's, that's the old style um, that, that we used to use, but now we've come in with some new technology. And we use a lot of GPS and satellite technology today. Um, and the way that works is that you've got satellite receivers up in the air. We have hundreds of these now. Um, and they're flying around. Uh, the collar initiates a location, talks to the different satellites. The satellites all coordinate, triangulate onto this animal, and put a point, onto the gra or a point on the ground where that animal is. Then, depending on the collar type, um, the, the data is either then distributed out into a server uh, that allows us to look at that data in real time, uh, or it's dropped back onto the collar, and we have to go out and pick up the collar and get the data off of it. Uh, we're going more and more to the system that keeps me in the office more, which is not great. Because now, you know, our upper, you know, uh, administration's all excited about us just being able to pull data off the internet. Uh, but it, again, keeps me at the computer a little bit more than I'd like. Um, but some an amazing technology. Battery, battery technology has also increased. That's a limiting factor on the number of locations that we can get per animal. Um, but today, because of, of battery technology, we can get upwards of 24 locations a day for a year or more, so one every hour. Uh, we did a study in bags where I was able to change that. And during a certain time of the year, I was getting locations every 30 to 45 minutes uh, for that time period. So it's a pretty amazing technology uh, that we have. With that said, though, what happens then is that we have a ton of data. Just for this, this is Cody covered in uh, all the most recent data from 2010 until current uh, for all the species that we've talked about. Uh, it was about 1.7 million points I ended up with when I started putting this presentation together. Um, and because of that, I think my computer has aged about 20 years because of all the data I was, I was kind of crunching through it. Um, and uh, for this presentation, we'll be looking at uh, uh, 359 different individuals between those four different species. Um, and I wish, I wish it just came in a package. You put it on, in the computer and it was, it was great. You didn't have to do anything with it. But unfortunately, you get kind of some outliers. You get some, uh, some problems. Some, uh, sometimes the locations aren't that great. Uh, sometimes a, an animal dies and you pick up the collar and you take it to your house and you forget to turn the collar off and people start to wonder who poached an animal. And, you're, and I, I don't know, that's not personal experience, I promise. But uh, um, so you've got to clean up the data. So there's a lot of uh, kind of front end work before you can really get into uh, looking at, at that information. So that's what we start with. Um, this is what I started with for uh, kind of looking at this talk um, and, and uh, as you can see, it's kind of a jumbled mess if you put it all together. So we're going to break it down in, uh, by species. We're going to uh, look at the different species that we're going to be looking at. Um, and then we're going to look at just several aspects to each of those species. One thing uh, with this up here, um, in most cases, um, especially with our mule deer and elk, we're looking at uh, different uh, use ranges. So typically on the eastern edge uh, of Cody is where we're going to have our winter range activity. So um, typically, and, and we'll see this in some of the data, uh, they'll show up anywhere uh, from beginning in late September uh, through December and even January for some of our elk. Um, and uh, they'll show up down here on the east. Summer range occurs on the western front. Uh, over here, uh, a lot of our animals are Yellowstone uh, Park animals. They spend their summers there. And, and there's not a ton of activity that, that happens in the middle here, especially with our, 
mule deer and elk. We definitely get more mountain goat and sheep uh, use in the middle in between, but for uh, mule deer and elk, there's just not a lot of use in between those, those two uh, ranges. So we're going to focus on mountain goats, bighorn sheep, uh, mule deer, and elk today. Uh, for each of those species, I'm going to again give you the kind of 100,000 foot view. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the populations of each, how they're doing, and uh, a little bit of survival information that we are getting from the collars. And then uh, we are going to look at some uh, general movement patterns. And then there's a few specific movements that I want to want to show you and want to kind of point out to you for each of these species. So we're going to start uh, with our introduced species. Um, if you didn't know, uh, mountain goats uh, were introduced uh, just north uh, uh, of, uh, of the line there, kind of at Lion Creek um, and over by um, uh, uh, Silvertip um, over, over in that country um, and have since moved south and, and as well as, as east. Um, we have basically two different uh, herds that we look at, we look at the bear tooth uh, herd, uh, which occurs in the bear tooth area, um, and then we've got our ab absorca herd, which uh, occurs uh, to the uh, west of uh, the Clark's Fork uh, River. Now, to manage this population, uh, we use a mix of uh, trend count flights. Uh, every other year, we go up, uh, we fly these areas. As you can see, kind of uh, behind the photo there, or behind the, the words, we fly these areas and try to count uh, goats that, that we're finding. Uh, we use helicopters for those surveys. Uh, we'd, we'd like to see um, between the two herds about 150 um, total mountain goats. Uh, la last time we counted, which was 2018, uh, we counted about 229. Not evenly distributed. Uh, the bear tooth herd seems to be doing um, uh, not as well as the absorca herd, so we're counting more in the absorca than we are in the bear tooth. And I didn't have a lot of uh, data slides up here, uh, but I did want to show you kind of where we flew in 2018. Um, you know, if funds were unlimited, we'd fly a lot more, but unfortunately, uh, we haven't found that unlimited pot. Uh, if you'd like to fund flights, let me know. I'll be here afterwards. Um, but uh, uh, from that, that flight, uh, we then average the number of animals that we see over the previous three years uh, of surveys, and we end up with uh, data like this. And so uh, on the left, you've got uh, our hunt area one or the bear tooth herd, um, and the years on the bottom, and then the three-year average number of goats. Um, and you can see that there's definitely a, a decline. Um, some of that is hunter-induced. We, we did uh, want to manage for fewer goats uh, in this area. Um, and so uh, you see some of that uh, happening, uh, but we feel like there's, there's a little bit something else going on there too that we're going to be looking at. Now over in Hunt Area 3 in the Absorca uh, herd, uh, again west of Clark's Fork River, we've actually been seeing uh, quite a bit of increase um, over the last several years. And that's a little bit concerning. I want you to keep that in mind as, as we move forward uh, and start to talk about where these animals are living and think about how animals uh, interact as well. For goats, uh, survival is, is typically, uh, if you're looking at annual survival, uh, year to year, um, anywhere from 80 to 85, 88 percent, and it's variable based on the season. And goats are interesting because they actually have a higher survival in winter, and you don't see that with uh, any of our un other ungulate species. And that's, they're made for winter. Um, and so when they, uh, winter comes, they go to the highest places where nothing else is going to go. And they lay down, and they're happy doing that. And uh, so their highest survival is actually during, uh, during the winter. Now, um, for mountain goats, I've got, uh, we've got about 46,000 points. Um, this is our least amount of data. Mountain goats are tough to catch. Um, they spend a lot of time in the wilderness, and there are restrictions on uh, animal capture in the wilderness that we have to work with the Forest Service on, um, and they're just they're they're hard to capture. So uh, it's kind of our our lowest number of, of individuals and our lowest number of points. But this is uh, kind of what it looks like. This is done from a study 
uh, a uh, uh, mountain ungulate study that looked at interactions between um, mountain goats and bighorn sheep. And this is what we, got, we have in our area as, as well as in Yellowstone. What I want you to note is look at uh, kind of the patterns of these points. Pretty constricted, uh, kind of living in, in uh, one area. There's not a lot of big movements for these guys. Um, and I think, you know, if you look on average between the 22 uh, individuals, there's, they move about 400 miles in the lifetime of their collars. Uh, but they really kind of pack in here tight. Once you release them, they don't go very far. There might be some migration across drainages, maybe from north slope to south slope, um, but there's not a lot of long distance uh, migrants. So I guess, yeah, the average distance traveled is about 334 miles. That's generally over a, a two-year lifespan of these collars. And uh, so then you end up with um, some, some nice lines, but for these guys, they, it, there's not much there. They don't do much, uh, many big movements. There's a couple of cross state boundary movements. There's a couple of movements out of the park, um, and, and especially down here. Our longest mover was actually down here, and we'll take a look at, at him. Um, he's actually, he was collared as a two-year-old male, and that makes sense. Uh, young males are gonna uh, typically move more uh, than any of the other uh, uh, sexes or ages because they're trying to find their place in the world. And so he was uh, doing a lot of moving back and forth. Um, he, over his lifespan from, uh, I think about a year and a half to two years, he, he moved about 474 miles. Just to orient you, this is Sunlight Peak. Um, and then uh, this is the North Fork coming up to Sunlight Peak. So he was all over this, this country here um, and spending a lot of time uh, up on the high ridges. This isn't him. Uh, <laughs> that'd be great if I could get a picture of him. But um, note the uh, uh, extra hardware we give these animals. Once we capture them during a capture event, they'll put those on the horns so that they don't recapture individuals on accident um, and so that they can, they can see them from the air pretty easily. Um, yeah, so 474 miles, a pretty good mover uh, as it relates to uh, mountain goats. I like these Google Earth. Uh, shots because it gives you a better idea of, of the terrain that they're actually covering. Um, you can see here, uh, this is Sunlight Peak right here. And so he's running up and down these, um, uh, these different ridges, running the ridge lines uh, up and down. Um, you know, I, I, I will never be able to follow this guy's track. Um, I know we're seeing all these new movies coming out where people are following migration routes of this or that. Uh, I don't know that you'll ever see one for a mountain goat, you know. Um, I, I don't know if that'll happen. I think I would quit pretty quickly. Um, and so, uh, so that's, that's our mountain goat kind of information uh, that I wanted to share with you, just kind of give you an idea. Um, let's move on to bighorn sheep. Now, bighorn sheep have always been here. Uh, and we have what, what we call a core native herd, and it's actually uh, the largest herd in uh, the lower 48 of North America. Um, currently, we're, we're running about 3,500 uh, sheep in the herd. Um, the herd stretches all the way, though, from the Montana boundary all the way down uh, almost to Dubois, so it's a pretty large, large area. Now, with these guys, uh, we use, again, a mix of uh, harvest data uh, as well as some classification uh, and survival data uh, to, to manage these. Um, a lot of our management, though, is heavily based on, on our harvest statistics uh, because we just can't get a, a big enough sample size to give us a lot of confidence in the, the estimate that we're coming up with uh, for these sheep. And so uh, these sheep numbers are down. Uh, if you've been out and about, been hunting, um, we, we have seen a decrease in our, in our sheep. Um, we've been running kind of under where we'd like them to be. We'd like them uh, more around the 4,500. And again, take this estimate with a grain of salt. Um, there's uh, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, kind of small sample size information that goes into this. But we, are, we feel like we are below where we like to be. Now, annual survival um, for bighorn sheep is similar to uh, mountain goats, around 84%. Um, with some uh, 
uh, variation around that. Um, but opposite of our mountain goats, their best survival is in summer, and that's typically what we'll see, and a really high survival of, of 97%. That's when you'll see these guys move up into these areas that are big and open, uh, high, nothing can reach them, um, and so they're, they're able to survive that way. However, with bighorn sheep, we're always concerned about populations. Um, and we've had, within the Absorco herd, mainly on the southern end, we've had big die-offs of bighorn sheep because of diseases, um, and mainly because of pneumonia diseases. So I ask everybody that I, that I talk to, if you're up the North Fork, South Fork, you see sheep down and you see a sheep coughing uh, or having a lot of snotty discharge, get a hold of us at the office, let us know so I can go check on that animal. Um, it is something that we, we want to try to keep out of the herd as much as possible. The other thing that, that we've been seeing over the last couple years uh, is scabies, which is a mite that basically eats all the hair off their back and uh, can make it, it can spread through the entire population. Um, so those sheep, unfortunately, uh, they, they like to die easily. So we're always very, uh, we have very uh, light gloves whenever we manage uh, sheep. Um, one thing that I'll, that I'll note with our movement data is that we don't, uh, the, the picture is not complete. Um, we have a lot of high elevation wintering sheep, and it's just hard to get to them to get collars on. So the data that you're going to see um, that we have is from sheep that are a little bit more accessible. So as we look here, we had uh, a little over 226,000 uh, points from 81 individuals uh, over the last four to five years here. And uh, a lot of movement here, but you see some holes um, and where there is probably sheep. But again, our ability to, to get to those sheep uh, is, is uh, decreased because of where they're living. So some of the future research that we're going to be looking at is how do we fill in these gaps and how do we understand what our high elevation sheep are doing? Because we can, we can collar these sheep along the North Fork all day long, right? Uh, but it's the sheep that live up high that are a little bit more difficult. Um, so the, the average distance traveled over the collar life is about 582 miles. And what you're going to see here from mountain goats to elk is a progression of length of movements. Here you can see that we're getting into a little bit different movement patterns. They're not staying on the same ridge. They are doing some movements, some migration uh, type of activities from one range to another. Um, and you're starting to get a little bit more of what we'd consider uh, like the artery type of, of migration. Not nearly as long as, as some of our other species, but much different than, than you would see uh, with, with mountain goats. And one of the areas that I want to kind of draw your attention to is up on the Montana border here, uh, up with the northern part of our herd. Um, pretty amazing movement. This actually uh, represents five sheep uh, that were collared on winter range over here and they summer over here. Um, they take a big trek uh, up and around. So let's look just a little bit closer at that. So the, the migration path um, uh, that goes around here is about 26 miles. Now that doesn't take into account the ups and downs and I'll get to that in just a second. That's just flat land 26 miles. Um, and they typically are spending um, oh, about 10 days to travel between uh, the summer range or the winter range and the summer range over here. Um, this particular female uh, that I pulled out has 27 months worth of data, and it over that time traveled about 881 miles. Um, and again, that's that's straight straight land miles. Okay. Um, what we see when we start to pull out the elevational changes that these sheep are making on a daily basis, uh, with this, with this, just with this one short run, one run across here, you change going up and down 30,000 feet. It's amazing to me that, that these guys are making that. Um, Google Earth allows you to look at kind of average slope, and on, for this particular uh, gal here, her average slope that she was living on or, or staying on was about 38%. So those are steep slopes that they're, they're living on and they're going up and down uh, throughout that time. So 
keep this one in mind too. We're going to come back uh, to this, uh, this example. And again, there were five uh, animals that were actually making that trek, that exact uh, line right through here. So this also presents some management challenges uh, as we have no management authority up here. Um, and they are moving through here when there are uh, hunting seasons going on. Um, so there's definitely, uh, we've got to be talking with Montana on, on management of, of those sheep. Now, if we move south, uh, I wanted to kind of point out one of the sheep that, you know, lives on the road here. Uh, what are they doing? Because um, you see them there, uh, you can drive up to them, you can get pictures of them pretty easy. And then they disappear, and it's kind of, where do they go? So I picked out one of the sheep that lives here uh, during the winter, usually October to May. And look at the movement that she makes. Um, many, you know, my initial thought was, well, they're probably just kind of popping up here and, and hanging out in the ridges up above. Um, but she goes uh, 21 miles to the park boundary um, and travels some pretty amazing country. Um, she takes about 10 days uh, to travel this uh, from uh, summer range uh, to winter range. Um, in 25 months of data collected, she, she moved about 819 miles, uh, which is uh, pretty impressive. Now, again, elevation is, is, is key. So we got 21 miles here um, if it's just straight land. But if you put in what, what is called a, an elevational graph, so starting over here, this is where she winters, uh, down on the road. Uh, these are all the different peaks that, that she crosses, uh, the highest being almost 12,000 uh, that she goes across. So once you do that, your distance actually increases to 28 um, for one way. And her elevational uh, gain and loss, about 22,000 feet. Um, and that's just one way. That's, that's one way. And one thing to start thinking about when we think about these migrations and these different movements is that when they leave winter range, um, where, where are they going? They're going to summer range. What do they usually do on summer range as a U? They're gonna, they've got something inside of them, right? Now, I've never been pregnant, uh, but I, my wife has been three times, and it didn't seem to be very pleasant towards the end. Um, and uh, so I can't imagine making this trek when you're carrying offspring um, and, and so keep that in mind, too, is, as they leave winter range, a lot of these females are preparing to give birth, and they've got to travel all this, this country. And this is kind of what it looks like on Google Earth. She uh, uh, lives down here on the road uh, and then hops up on the ridge. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Elks Fork. Uh, she comes and she crosses the Elks Fork, goes up, up and over, um, and back down, and just keeps crossing these giant drainages. Um, and, and then comes up a ridge and ends up summering again up by the park there. Just uh, amazing movements and, and something you don't think of when you see and you're taking pictures of these animals uh, on the side of the road. So um, I told you to remember that uh, the earlier movement with, with the uh, um, bighorn sheep, we have five sheep that are moving back and forth. The, uh, bla the uh, black Triangles represent bighorn sheep. The yellow dots indicate mountain goats. So what we see here is we start to see some, some big overlaps in both summer and winter range uh, for our um, bighorn sheep with mountain goats. Now, part of the data that I'm presenting here uh, was a study to look exactly at that. What, it, what, it, uh, what are the potentials for uh, having bad things happen uh, with these. And so a, a uh, recent publication out of Ecological Applications uh, by um, uh, Blake Lowry and a group out of University of Montana uh, talked about that niche or what they use similarities among introduced and native mountain ungulate uh, populations. And what they, what they determined was that there is a potential for mountain goats to disturb or displace uh, bighorn sheep throughout this range. Um, and so it's a, it's a de delicate management situation because I know that people like mountain goats. Uh, mountain goats were introduced though. Um, and so our job as, as wildlife managers is to take this data and understand what's going on in those interactions. 
And so we, with this collar data, we're able to get this uh, type of information. Now, let's move quickly through uh, some mule deer and some elk here. Um, mule deer, we'll be talking about two different herds, the Clark's Fork uh, population and the upper Shoshone, which is everything uh, North Fork and South Fork, basically. Um, we use classification information where we're going out counting does and fawns and bucks. Um, we use harvest information, we use our survival information to estimate population size. And then we compare that population size to where uh, we believe that populations uh, can, uh, can be held at. And uh, currently within the Clark's Fork and the Upper Shoshone, uh, we're, we're down on mule deer. And so we'd like to see four to 6,000 in Clark's Fork. We're uh, probably more around 3,000 uh, in the Upper Shoshone. Uh, we'd like to see, you know, nine to uh, 14,000, um, and we're currently at probably about 8,000 to uh, 8,500, 8,600, somewhere around there. Um, there's a variety of things that are going on there. If, if you want to talk mule deer, let's talk afterwards, and we'll talk for hours more, because uh, uh, that's a whole different subject uh, for sure. Um, but this is kind of what it looks like over the, the last several years. Uh, numbers have been kind of low. Um, Starting about 2013-14, uh, we started to see a series of, of pretty bad winters here, uh, as many of you have lived through them. And so we've started to see that, that population decline a little. Uh, annual survival based on our uh, collar data is about 80 to 85 percent, um, which is rather low for mule deer. Um, if you look in other parts of the state, uh, we typically use a survival rate of about 90 to uh, 93 percent on adult uh, females. Uh, but that's just not the case here. And our obviously have better survival in the summer. Um, we see a, a lot of our po our, the population being driven by the fact that we have low fawn productivity. And again, that's not the uh, topic today. Uh, so if you want to talk more about that, we sure can. All right, we've got 75 individuals that we have collared uh, from 2016 to 2018 um, and about 200,000 points at this, uh, at this juncture. Um, what you can see, again, is that you start to stretch these out a little bit more. They start to look more like these arteries, these um, uh, different types of, of migration paths, right? Um, and we see it here. What's one of the interesting things that I've, I've found over uh, while putting this talk together is that the average distance traveled over the collar life for the Clark's Fork and the Upper Shoshone are quite a bit different. Um, and I'm interested to, to explore that a little bit more. But over the lifespan of uh, the Clark's Fork, about 704 miles versus 582 miles uh, for the uh, uh, upper Shoshone. I think a lot of that might have to do with uh, summer range uh, quality. Uh, once they get to summer range, uh, they may not have to move as much down here. Maybe the food quality is better. So they're not spending as much time walking around looking for food, whereas they are up here. So. Anyways, that, that's more information to come, and, and um, as is with most um, research projects, you go to answer a question, and you just come up with more, right? And that's, uh, that's what happened here. All right, so I wanted to focus on a couple of really kind of longer distance movements from our uh, mule deer. Um, Clark's Fork, this deer starts off on winter range just north of uh, Hart Mountain, goes all the way up to Clark's Fork Canyon, or, or kind of cuts across, gets into the canyon here, and actually ends up uh, summering up by, uh, up by Silvertip up there. So, and then down here, this is a deer that, that lives in uh, one of our employees' uh, yards, I believe. And uh, uh, she looks forward to seeing her every year. And I thought I'd, I'd share that one with you. So we're going to look at those two. This is the, uh, the Clark's Fork one, or Silvergate. I was saying tip, sorry. Silvergate in Cook City. Um, and this is where that, that deer summers, is up in this country here. But she makes that long trek all along the, the base here. But look down here when she starts to, she goes straight up, up and over and up and over. Uh, you can see it way out here. Uh, pretty amazing, about 51 miles straight line. Um, and this is what her elevational gradient looks like. Um, I think we're looking uh, winter range over here and summer range over here. Um, but that adds another, you know, six miles to her, her trek, and her elevation gain and loss is about 20,000 feet. Again, when she leaves winter range, she's heavy with fawn and doing that um, every year, year in and year out. 
and it's tough on them. I, I have numerous, uh, many uh, trail camera pictures showing that these animals are coming to the top of the ridge with their mouths open, breathing hard. It's not like it's an easy thing for them to do. And they're doing this consistently uh, every year. Um, you see a fawn here in the background. Um, it's pretty amazing to go through these trail camera pictures and see what these animals are going through to, to get to and from the ranges that they need. Now that second one, this is uh, the South Fork River right here. Uh, this is Ishawa um, and then Lapella. Um, and this uh, deer is taking a, a route that is, is pretty common for deer. Uh, we've seen this quite a bit. She comes up here, uh, drops into Pass Creek, and then drops into the thoroughfare. Um, I'm going to come back to the thoroughfare in a minute, but uh, they knew what they were doing when they, they named it. Um, there's a ton of animals that use it. And she ends up way down by Jackson Lake. Uh, but look at the country she's covering. Uh, if you look at the elevational plot there, again, uh, about 60 miles she's actually covering, uh, getting up to uh, heights of almost uh, a little over 10,000 feet um, in elevation. I haven't even mentioned the rivers that these animals are crossing uh, as well. During the time of year when the rivers are, you don't want to be crossing those rivers. Uh, we're going to see an example of a, uh, an elk here in a second that she got to the river and said, no, nah, I don't think so. Um, so um, just another, uh, another image showing you the difficulties, and, and this comes from uh, the North Fork, the difficulties of actually living as an animal migrating throughout uh, the Absorca range. All right, let's move on to, to elk finally. Um, elk, we've got two different herds as well, kind of like the deer, Clark's Fork and Cody. Um, and with these, these elk, we actually do population trend counts. So that means we go out, uh, we count animals, we average that count with the previous three years uh, to give us a, a total number. Um, within the Clark's Fork, um, there's a lot of variability, uh, but currently we're a little bit below where we'd like to be. Um, with the upper Shoshone, or I'm sorry, I should say uh, Cody, uh, we're currently uh, a little bit above where we'd like to be. There's a lot of variability, a lot of things uh, that play into this, and uh, it has to do with some of the movement data that, that we've got. Annual survival uh, is, is pretty good. Uh, with the study that we just started, about 85% um, survival. But what's amazing is that uh, Arthur Middleton found in, in uh, 2010 through uh, 15 with his study is that if they could reach uh, adult cow status, that their survival increased to almost 100%. Um, so as they uh, mature, they learn how to uh, deal with the challenges out on the landscape. So this is by far the biggest data set that we have, a little over a million points at this, uh, at this juncture. And this doesn't even take into account the studies that happened uh, where they were going out and tracking animals by hand. Uh, this is all just uh, GPS data. And so we've got 180 individuals at this point, and uh, that's the, the blobs is what it looks like. Um, with elk, what you see is a lot more uh, variability in their movement and also uh, being tied to a winter range or even being tied to migrate. Uh, we just uh, published a paper recently showing that uh, elk are less likely to migrate uh, if the food's good. So they'll, they'll change. They will change. And you can see some of that in some of these movement patterns that, that we're seeing out here. And I'll show you one specifically here in just a minute. Um, again, expanding though. You see these, these longer routes. We see a lot more movement. We, we tend to see that elk are always on the move. And you can see that from the, number, the uh, average number of miles that are traveled uh, based on collar. So we almost doubled what we saw uh, with our deer. And so within that time period, they're traveling a long way. Um, they're looking for bigger food sources. They've got a bigger body. They've got to uh, uh, get up on these plateaus and move quite a bit. And so... What I really wanted to focus on were, with elk is just these kind of these uh, uh, areas that are concentrated with elk movement. Um, and this has really helped to drive, our, uh, drive another piece of management information, which is trail cameras. So you see here, this is uh, Cabin Creek. This is uh, um, Eagle Creek. Coming up here, this is Eagle Pass right here. Um, and we see just a, a very 
tight movement of elk up, uh, up in this area. Um, here's another one at Thoroughfare. Here's Pass Creek, um, and here's Thoroughfare, and you can see that these animals are just jamming into this little spot right here. Um, here's another one coming off of Needle Creek and up over in Fall Creek here. Um, I don't know how many of you are horse people or how many of you have ever been up Fall Creek. Yeah, it's not a really a trail. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's a horrible trail. I went up it once, and I, I don't know if I'll go back. But um, uh, So they're traveling up that. Um, they're making some, some pretty serious elevation change in a, in a short period. Now, what I wanted to show you is the overlap with mule deer and, and elk. So in purple, we've got uh, mule deer, and in, in the uh, beige color, we've got the elk. And here's thoroughfare, and here's uh, open creek right here. And so what you can see is that these animals are piling into that uh, small of an area uh, as they're migrating. So it's, it's, it's definitely not species specific. Um, what that allows us to do though, when we see these pinch points, is utilize it for better data collection. And so we've done that. Um, currently I've got close to 40 trail cameras set up across uh, the mountains at all these different locations that allows me to get a better idea of number of animals uh, coming through those areas each year and what the makeup of them is. Uh, these are cool areas because we, both, we get both mule deer and elk. Um, and the same in, in a couple of these other uh, spots where we're getting both species uh, moving through. And actually uh, sheep um, as well. Don't get too many goats in, in any of these, these spots though. So I wanted to show you, uh, this is an elk that we collared just this last year in uh, February. Um, she stayed kind of down. This is the Matitsi Rim country. Here's Carter Mountain. Uh, Matitsi Rim's right back here. Uh, she lived there for the winter and then took off, uh, spent some time in Yellowstone. Uh, I think she came into some money because she moved down by Jackson. I, <laughs> it's the only thing I can figure. Um, I'm not really sure why she's down there. Uh, you know, she wintered here. Um, you never see this with mule deer. They never switch winter ranges. She was over here, got to talking to some other cows, and decided to go south. Um, and so now she's living down there. That, these locations right here are as of about a week ago. So she's still down there. Um, so it's pretty amazing uh, that the, the elk uh, can do that. And we've seen it in other studies. I've seen it down in bags. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And this is kind of the elevational gradient uh, that she travels. Uh, 66 miles, 26,000 feet of elevation change. Uh, she goes through um, her migration carrying a large calf. Uh, in her in her stomach there so um, one thing let me back up I forgot to point this out look at this little blib right here this is the Yellowstone River there's a little blib here why did she stop there uh, those are the things that kind of come to my mind and we go in and we plot these points here's the river Yellowstone River all these points are right at the beginning of June does anybody know what happens to elk at the beginning of June they drop they drop calves so she got to the river and is like, eh, I think I'm going to hang out here for a while. Either the river was really high or, um, you know, in June, I can't even imagine trying to get across the Yellowstone. Um, and so she, she ended up hanging out here for, uh, I think it's about, um, about nine days there uh, that she hung out there and then went across. And I have every belief that she had a calf and she made that calf swim the river. It's amazing. These, these animals are absolutely amazing. Here's another one. I just wanted to show you a weird movement that we had never seen before. We captured this elk over on Sheep Mountain. Uh, she went down, hung out at the fields, was a problem there, uh, decided to come up, and she actually went across drainage and across uh, Carter Mountain, uh, came down, spent the rest of her winter uh, down on Matitsi Rim, almost out to 120 out here, and then took off. And, and made the migration through Boulder Basin, up fall, down thoroughfare, and lived over uh, uh, kind of um, up behind our cabin there. I can't remember the name of that mountain there. Uh, somebody else will. But, but anyway, she's living up in the park there. Um, and so just an amazing movement there. One thing I wanted to point out, though, is with our elk, we have seen a switch from uh, migratory to kind of more local movements. This is an elk that we collared on Matitsi Rim, and she basically lived along the uh, kind of southeast uh, uh, side of Carter Mountain 
This is her entire movement. And we're seeing that. And, and it's something that uh, really throws a wrench into management is when you have animals that are migrating and animals that are not. And what we also see with animals that are migrating, lower calf ratios. With animals that are not migrating, higher calf ratios. Now, how many of you have heard of brucellosis? Brucellosis is a big deal. And so with brucellosis, guess who's probably going to be getting in trouble? And guess who's growing calves and growing at a higher rate than the elk that are migrating? So these kind of things help us to determine what portion of the population that we see in the winter uh, are, are not migrating, that are kind of living there, and uh, helps us to also kind of form and fashion hunting seasons. So let me ask again, are they living the easy life? No. The thing that I, that I want to instill today as I, as I leave is that even though it seems like these animals are, are doing well on winter range and uh, there's plenty of them out there, you see them all the time, we've really got to do our part in their little part of their life cycle when they come down here. We've got to do our part uh, to make sure that we're not creating more difficulties, that, uh, um, that, we're not, that we're sharing that space in a way that allows them uh, to not to have such a hard time uh, while they're down here. And I, I, I just reference these things because they are a reality. Um, when we look at fences, we look at roads, um, there's issues there. I would say on the south and north fork, we take uh, more does and fawns uh, with vehicles than we ever would with, with a rifle. Um, and so as, as we go out from here and, and, and think about the movement patterns of these animals, you know, we've, we've really got to do our part to ensure that fences are safe, that uh, we're slowing down our roads, uh, that we're, we're really watching for the wildlife out there. I want to thank you for your attention, and this is the end. Thank you.